All right, welcome to Speak For Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley in an Easter suit. <laughs> that dude. Yes, sir. Baby. All right, coming up, Clean. we'll tell you if coaches are avoiding the Lakers because of LeBron, but we start in the NFL. Yesterday morning, Nick O'Malley at MassLive.com wrote a very interesting story on Patriot Superstar quarterback Tom Brady. The headline of the story is, is Tom Brady the lowest paid starting quarterback not on a rookie contract? Brady is scheduled to make $15 million this season. O'Malley's story argues that at the moment, the distinction depends on whether journeyman Ryan Fitzpatrick emerges as the starter in Miami. Fitzpatrick will earn $5.5 million this season. O'Malley's story is terrific, but it omits one highly important name, Giselle Bungeon. In the words of Kevin Durant, she's the real MVP. Hmm. Marriage is mankind's most important business decision. We foolishly think of marriage as a love decision. That's why the American divorce rate is astronomical. Love is an emotion that comes and goes. A sound business decision can reap benefits for generations. Giselle is worth more money than Tom Brady. Her wealth gives Brady the flexibility to do whatever he wants with his football career. His self-worth as a football player isn't tied to his paycheck because it doesn't have to be. You know how easy it is to love someone who is an amazing asset to your career? It's a lot easier than loving someone, than being married to someone who hurts your bottom line. Trust me. That's why earlier this week, I had nothing but praise for Sierra and Russell Wilson. Sierra is a different kind, but just as important asset to Wilson. Sierra played the role of bad guy in Wilson's contract negotiations with the Seahawks. She allowed Wilson and his agent to bluff that Wilson would leave Seattle and move to New York to improve Sierra's singing career. Giselle gives Tom the freedom to take less. Sierra helped Russell get more. Brady's the NFL's most underpaid player, which has played a significant role in him being the league's most accomplished player. Wilson is now the highest paid player in the NFL, which compensates for the fact he spent seven years in Seattle as the least supported star quarterback in the league. Brady and Wilson are right where they're supposed to be, thanks to their wives. Brady waited until age 30 to marry Giselle. Wilson, after a failed marriage with a college sweetheart, married Sierra at age 27. My point is, if you're smart enough to avoid marrying the last person you dated in high school or college, you have a much better chance of making a smart business decision when you get married. I know I sound old and cold, but I'm right. The Mount Rushmore for the Patriots dynasty is Robert Kraft, Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, and Giselle Bungeon. New England should retire her stiletto heels hmm. when the Patriots retire Brady's jersey. All right, joining the desk now, a couple of married guys, a former Super Bowl champion, Chris hmm. Canny, a former Pro Bowl wide receiver, TJ Hoosmanzada, and of course, the first man of this show, <laughs> man of this show, hey, wait Marcellus a minute. Wiley. I don't know how I think First married man. First married man. I, like, I, don't, I don't know why <laughs> Whitlock put that marriage thing yeah, on me. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, It's Marcellus, not Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> First oh, lady. Come on now. Anyway, does Giselle deserve some credit mm? for the Patriots being able to sustain this success? <sighs> I, I know where you're going, man, but it's a stretch for me. Um, I think it was omitted for a reason. Giselle was not given full credit for a reason. Uh, if you Tom Brady, you got to quote some Cube right now. Uh, I won three of my first four Super Bowls before I even met you, Giselle. I won three in my first four years as a starter in NFL, and I didn't even know who Giselle Bunchy was if I'm Tom Brady. So I started this gangster, and this the thanks I get? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Like, y'all gonna now shift it, and the dynasty continues, and we get married in 2009, all of a sudden Giselle's on board, and obviously the better half and respected them and laying it down in terms of foundation for the family and that stability, but Tom Brady was doing this as a sixth-round draft choice, underpaid, undervalued, and was getting it. So, Giselle, respect to you but more respect to Tom Brady for well, starting. No question, Tom Brady. <laughs> so, so what, what, what am I giving her credit? But she, I mean, mean touchdowns? The she? last 10 years, she has allowed this man not to worry about money. The Patriots have used the money. He's the lowest paid NFL starter that's not on the rookie deal. That has helped the Patriots. 
and that's because he can make those Quick decisions. example before we go to some other yeah. married guys. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, uh, one married guy. Hey, one married guy, man. Stop putting that on me. <laughs> oh, man, man. Why y'all trying to marry me off? <laughs> uh, space shuttle launch. Uh, do you know that they use 80% of their fuel on launch? 80%. Most of your energy on anything <laughs> is because it takes so much to get it going. The rest kind of gets into All good right, habits so, and autopilot. So you're giving Giselle 20%. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Hey, All listen, right. like, you talked about marriage being a yeah. love decision. No, that's a business. Mm. Well, no, when he talked about people marrying because they're in love, yeah. and they're getting it twisted. But all I'm going to say is this. It's easy to love a woman that's got a nine-figure bank account. <laughs> that's exactly where Giselle mm. Bunchin is. And listen, I appreciate what she brings to the table and being able to support her husband and Tom Brady not having to worry about the financial implications with his playing career. And definitely that's been of help for the New England Patriots. But if you're going to give Giselle Bunchen credit, then you got to give Woody Johnson some credit from the New York Jets because guess what? What have they won? Well, I'm going to tell, <laughs> well, tell you this. Well, if Woody Johnson wasn't the owner and it was Leon Hess, guess what? Bill Belichick would still be the HC of the oh, NYJ. You're going there. You're going and deep. if you're going to do that, well, I, I mean, we could even take it further yeah, back. That's untangled. You want to go back to the Cleveland Browns in 95? Mm. They made the decision to fire Bill Belichick when they moved in the middle of the night to go to Baltimore and they hired Ted March and Broder. So guess what? Bill Belichick might not have been available for a head coaching job. He might have still been the guy in Baltimore had the Browns not made that Since decision. Since you passing out credit. Since you me. passing out credit, I mean, we can take it I'll all the way back credit. to that. I'll give them some credit, not as much as just. I mean, <laughs> we, we know that <laughs> indirectly behind the scenes, she deserves credit. It's when, when you play in the NFL, especially as a quarterback, the time that you put in, yeah. financially, I'm giving her no credit. Because you no, could say, no, 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 no. Because, at one point, Tom Brady was the highest paid quarterback in the league. He's taking deals, and later on, once we delve into this a little more in this topic, I'll tell you why he's taking less, in my opinion. I'll get to that later. Oh, okay. But behind the scenes, all the time he spends at the facility going over film, the reason she deserves credit is because she's able to say, okay, I know this is important to you. Because that's a lot of time that she don't get with him. She, she doesn't have, we not going out to eat. No. We don't have a lot of time together during the season. And so for her to take a back seat, she deserves credit in that aspect because there's a lot of women like, where's my time? Baby, mm. this football season, your time is after the season. Mm. And so from that perspective, she does deserve credit. Mm. He just added to my argument, and I appreciate that, TJ. But I, I will just again, we are all in agreement. Tom Brady is a different animal as it relates to NFL player in terms of how he approaches money in the NFL. Because he could be, he could force his way into being the highest paid player or somewhere in that category. Well, we, we are in agreement, but we didn't, Tom Brady didn't have a smooth uh, decision to make, and, and it wasn't a smooth road, I should say, for Tom Brady in getting to this place. Remember, let's go into the, some of the details. He was the highest paid quarterback before. There were times where he said, I would take a haircut for Wes Welker. And then that $2 million haircut, Wes Welker dipped, went to Denver, and then they said, well, Tom was like, can I get my $2 million back? And they're like, oh, no. They've had issues and contention, even him becoming Tom Brady now Mr. Haircut for the franchise. So don't think that Tom Brady just raised his hand in, in good faith and being a good citizen, said, I want to be lower paid so everyone else could blossom. He did it for direct reasons and resources, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Well, I think we have to take a step back and realize that not every player makes decisions based on the financial aspect of things. I mean, it's clear to us that Tom Brady wants to be considered if one of, if not the greatest quarterback of all time. And I think he's made certain concessions in order to do that. And a part of that decision is allowing the organization some financial flexibility because he's not taking up 15, 17% of the salary cap. If you paid him what he was worth, then yeah, it would limit Bill Belichick's options in terms of putting the right supporting cast around him. But I think Tom Brady is looking at this and saying, you know what? It's important to me to be considered one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game. He's prioritizing legacy over financial gain. And based on his, his marriage with Giselle, he has the freedom to do that. But I'm not certain that Tom Brady doesn't make Guys. that same decision, even if he's not married to Giselle. Mm -hmm. made, I don't know that. Yeah. When you've made $212 million, it's easy to take less. <laughs> Tom Brady's made $212 million in his career. It's oh, easy to oh, take. It's easy to take. On the field. On the field. We ain't oh, talking so about them endorsements. It's, it's easy about. to, like, oh, people, whoa, whoa, whoa. If it's easy, how come no one else does it? Be Ooh. How many people have made $200 million playing football? How many people Russell have Wilson's come not in that through, category. How many Aaron people Rogers have come through there. the NFL hey, Manning, Eli. and made $200 million? Hey, Manning, Eli. So if I can make 24, but I'll take 20, okay, for my legacy, 
I'm willing to do that. I, Peyton I, Manning didn't do it. Eli's not doing it. And, and you well, look Eli's at, being forced to do yeah, something. Forced to now. <laughs> but but you, Peyton, you look at how many Super Bowls did Peyton Manning win? It's two, no two. right, and it's no comparison when you say who's the, the greatest quarterbacks in the NFL. He took a haircut after he stacked his bank account and said, okay, I'll start taking pay cuts because now I want to leave no doubt. When you say who's the greatest quarterback, it's for sure going to be me because now on the back end, I will take a pay cut because I've made so much early on. I just don't think many athletes or many professionals in any career make the decision Tom Brady's made. And again, I'm, I don't think he's Superman. I think he's married to a superwoman who's worth a ton of money, and it makes it easier for him to make that decision. For sure. Than, than virtually anybody else. Well, he's making else. a one in a million decision because he's one in a million. One, he's one in a million from six rounder to even being a starter, let alone franchise player, let alone dynastic quarterback in six Super Bowls and maybe counting. Uh, two, you talk about he made 200 plus million. That's rarefied air in the NFL. Three, you marry somebody with nine figures. So when you make so many one in a million decisions, you can now have the luxury to do things like he's doing it. But I don't know if that means that he's a little different in terms of character or he's just so different in where he is in the stage of career and in terms of what he's leveraging. He's le I never wanted to leverage legacy. Legacy to me is what others define you as. That is not my primary concern. My primary concern is what I do for my family and give them resources and opportunities and exposures. Y'all can say what you want about me in terms of legacy, but as long as these seeds are planted in, in greater that's ground... That's legacy for me. That's yeah. legacy to me, right. and I'm not taking a cent less. Now, Tom Brady did a different way. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the conversation of would you rather be overpaid or underrated? And I think you, TJ, and I would rather be overpaid than mm. underrated. So I, I look at Tom Brady as a different animal, though, in this whole regard because Tom Brady does have that chip on his shoulder and we've seen that it's hard to have that type of success over the span of two decades like Tom Brady has to make it to eight Super Bowls and be able to win as many as he has I mean you have to appreciate what he's done he's found a way to continuously fuel himself and all I'm saying is I don't think that that's motivated by money and I'm not sure that it would be any different if he weren't married to Giselle listen I, I will the reason I brought this is twice we hit this topic this week. Earlier in the week with CR and Russell Wilson. It's a, it's a serious topic for me. And I, you guys are married. Chris, you, you had a great long NFL career. It's a serious topic. And I want to ask, should athletes, professional athletes, and all men in general, but we're going to reduce it to professional athletes, should they approach marriage as a business decision? Should that be a portion or a larger portion of your decision making when it comes to marriage. Hmm. Going here, huh? Yeah. Again. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, uh, I wasn't married when I played for re business reasons. Uh, I wanted to be preoccupied and completely focused on my career, the highs, the lows, whatever that materialized into, without that being in negotiation with love. So that's why I stay single. Um, but now, looking back at it, I thought it was a smart decision, but I respect those who are married, like a TJ, through it. You can see a different level of focus, a different level of stability, maybe. But I've seen it work all types of ways. Remember, I played pre-social media. So I know married for real. I know married for fake. <laughs> wow. Let's be real. Now, I'm not going to say any names, but I saw focus with guys who weren't married, and I saw lack of focus for guys who were married. I've seen guys be Hall of Famers, who weren't married and Hall of Famers who were married. So I can split this evenly in half. There are guys like, uh, we just talked about it. We talk about Ciara and Russell Wilson. You could talk about it right now when we're talking about uh, Tom Brady. You could talk about in NBA. You could talk about a Russell Westbrook. But then I could, and LeBron, then I could flip it on you. And I could say, damn, but Kevin Durant's balling. Where's his wife? No wife. Um, I could look in the NFL and I could look at Aaron Donald. I could look at Aaron Rodgers. Like, where are their wives? Oh, they ain't got one. And so you can get up that mountain anyway. There's a lot of trails around here, around this mountain. So I never say that you have to look at it any certain way. Whatever gets you up that mountain, do it your way. Well, here's the thing. In life, you always look for an asset, not a liability. I don't think it's any different in terms of the spouse that you're going to choose. 
the most important thing is to recognize that you have a finite of period of time to be able to play professional sports. And so you want to be with somebody that's going to allow you to maximize that opportunity. And it's not necessarily about the financial gain that's involved. It's just about appreciation, appreciating the opportunity to play the sport at the highest level. Clearly, Tom Brady has done that. Tom Brady was successful before he married Giselle Bündchen. Mm -hmm. That's probably why he had an opportunity to marry Giselle Bündchen. He, he won three Super Bowls before they got married. Then he won three Super Bowls after they were married. Been to nine of them. So I can appreciate what Giselle has done to him. I'm just recognizing that this Tom Brady guy, he's a little bit different. He's a top competitor, and I don't think that changed the fact that he's married to Giselle Bündchen. Man, it's, this here, this question here is tough because mm -hmm. you, your wife it, is watching. No, 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 no. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, you know, you know what my wife always tell me. Yeah. Oh, I had money before you. She always tell me that. You know, she didn't come from a super rich family, but her family they had a lot of rental properties, and, and yep. she had her own money before me. She'll tell me she helped me more early on than I did for her. She'll she'll tell me that. Good business decision, it, TJ. Right, good business. Decision, <laughs> right. You but, married for, up. For me, is if you marry or you talk or think about marrying somebody for what they have, I, it's not going to last. It, it's not going to last because then when you get what that, you got, then it's going to, it. you feel like, I don't even need you no more. I really <laughs> didn't like you to begin with. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't reduce it down to marrying somebody for what they have, but I, marrying somebody for what they can do for you over the long term, as opposed to a lot of decisions, oh, I just so love her, and oh, this feels so good. This is the greatest feeling I ever had. You know what it is? If, if you're mature enough, it, to me, it doesn't matter. It, it, that's the thing, is what you're talking about. Some guys get there different ways. Yeah. Like, there's different ways. To get, if you're mature enough and you can handle being married at an early age and it doesn't affect your play and your focus on the sport that you're playing, go do it. But if you one of those guys that I know I can't be married because it's going to cost, then don't do that as well. It just really depends on the player and the circumstance that you're in. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really like the number of greats that are married is equal by the number of greats that are single. Uh, you, you get a James Harden out there. You get a Klay Thompson. Like, like, like <laughs> then you get guys who were married, Tiger Woods, respect. Eh. Uh, you know, got to go bring a tiger in there, man. I, I, I do my job. Uh, you know, Michael Jordan, like people been, like even Russell Wilson, respect, but you are divorced. So, so you came one. into the game yeah. and then, uh, Tom Brady, respect, but you got baby mama too with the baby, like, he made a good business. Same life. age kids. <laughs> made a hell of I got a business. sister like that, so I know how the game goes. You know what I mean? So the point is, you can look at any way around the circumference of this mountain, but there's a lot of people going up there, different trails, different paths. I think it's about surrounding yourself with the right person, aligning yourself with the right person. How would you know, single? Well, well I'm going to say this. I think it's easier to do it with a support system than without. Mm. And so when you start talking about the marriage relationship, there is no greater support system if you have a healthy marriage. So when looking at yeah. a high-pressured yeah. occupation like playing in the National Football League, what Giselle Bunchen has done for Tom Brady, you can't deny that it's impacted his career in a positive way. Oh. I'm just saying that Tom Brady would have been in the conversation for being the greatest quarterback of all time with or without Giselle. Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, options, ETFs, and cryptos, all commission-free. They strive to make financial services work for everyone, not just the wealthy. They provide a non-intimidating way for stock market newcomers to invest for the first time with true confidence. It's simple and intuitive with a clear design of data presented in an easy-to-digest way. What are the values of the Robinhood app, you may ask? the design and ease of use. It has easy to understand charts and market data so you can place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. Robinhood's web platform also lets you view stock collections and analyst ratings of buy, hold, and sell for every stock. Also, you can learn by doing. Learn how to invest as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks and track favorite companies with your personalized news feed. You can even set custom notifications for price movement so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at speak.robinhood.com. That's speak, S-P-E-A-K, dot robinhood.com. Let's return to the NFL and a big story in Jacksonville where Jags Executive Vice President Tom Coughlin expressed his frustration with two of the team's top defensive players for skipping voluntary workouts 
Cornerback Jalen Ramsey and linebacker Telvin Smith were the team's only players who didn't show up for the start of the Jags offseason program. Head coach Doug Marone says he reached out to both players but didn't hear back. The Jazz are coming off a disappointing 5-11 season that saw them lose 10 of their final 12 games. We're very close to 100% attendance, and quite frankly, all our players should be here. Building the concept of team, working hard side by side, constructing our bond of togetherness, formulating our collective priorities and goals. Success in the NFL demands struggle. Those who have everything given to them become lazy, selfish, and insensitive to the real values of team. The hard work that many try to avoid is the major building block for the development of an outstanding football team. It's not about rights and privileges. It's about obligations and responsibility. And the question is, can we count on you? Mm. <laughs> wow. And he actually wrote that. He didn't even go off the head. He was reading. Mm -mm -mm. Love it. I know wow. y'all Easy, TJ. Oh. That's my guy now. I know you playing Coughlin for him. is my guy. Yeah, the Super Bowl is. ring I got was on the team that he was the head coach of. I respect love that. Love wow. it. I'm just mad that we cut the video short before he said, get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> get, up, man, you get that old, you know what he's saying? archaic mindset out get of Get off here. my 5-11. and 11. I'm here to win championships, hey, hey, you and know we were trash last year. You know what? And that's what's funny. It's so funny that people are so result-based in their work habits when you're not supposed to be. It's supposed to be the flip. People always say winning is a habit. No, it's not. Winning habits help you win. You have to work on formulating winning habits. If you trusted your system last year, why are you tripping this year, coach? Oh, you don't trust your system. So now you want to throw that out and make something that's voluntary mandatory. Why aren't OTAs part of a winning habit? First of all, it's because it's voluntary. I'm going to tell you why. Because there are going to be guys who are leaders on ball clubs that are not even they on even, the squad They're yet. not even in OTAs they not yet. Even, they ain't even <laughs> they're just working they, out. Baker Mayfield wasn't even on the squad last Jaylen year. Jalen Ramsey was trash last year. Jalen Ramsey was not up to standard. Trust. But, but he's he still all trash. pro. And he wasn't trash. And he still is an all pro. Everything's so based on expectations. Hold on. This is, it turns into, like, OTAs turns into, at times, babysitting. Like, we want to see you punch the clock and see you working on your game. When they don't trust that I think my game is more important to me than it is to you, so I'm always going to work on my game. Two, this team effort building, there's a moment of truth in football called when that ball is in the air, when your hand is in the dirt. April ain't going to necessarily translate to that moment. You can say it is because of attendance rates, but I'm just here to tell you that there are many a leaders like a Tom Brady who's missed multiple I hope years. I Urban Meyer isn't listening to you right now. I hope, I, hope he, I hope he is. Great Tom Brady has missed multiple years of voluntary workouts. How's that worked out for him? Well, here's the thing, Marcellus. I agree with you and disagree with you at the same time because I do believe that a part of putting together your football team starts with the off-season training program. Bill Parcells was a big believer in making sure that his guys got their weights, got their conditioning, didn't love OTAs. He didn't take them seriously. We had a couple of OTA practices leading into minicamp, and then he let us go on about our business because OTAs ain't really football because you can't have the pads on. But the off-season strength and conditioning program is important. I know Coach Coughlin believes in that. My thing is, when you're coming out and openly criticizing Telvin Smith, Pro Bowl linebacker, mm. one of the leaders on your defense, and then Jalen Ramsley, one of the guys that's known to be one of the hardest training guys in the offseason. That, that's what I have a problem with. Jalen Ramsey hasn't changed anything about his workout routine since he's been in the National Football League. He trains with his father at that workout facility that he's got, and he's always come in and given you his best effort. Now, to your point, Whitlock, Jalen Ramsey wasn't great last year, but a lot of guys weren't great on that Jacksonville Jaguars team, but that's in part because they quit because the quarterback play was so poor. And Tom Coughlin was the one that gave Blake Bortles a contract extension. Right, Not those right. guys on the defensive side right. of the ball. The Jacksonville Jaguars defense was top five in points and yards. So if you want to point the finger at guys, you need to point the finger at yourself because there were some poor decisions that were made That's in constructing good. this roster, especially on the offensive side of the That's ball. That's pretty good, Chris. That was pretty Listen. Good. It's, okay, I'm just, it's one word. I'm just saying. I'm just, I mean, let's call it fact. Voluntary. <laughs> Thank you. Voluntary. Like, I choose to be there or I choose not to be there. Thank you. It's as simple as that. And for you to just sit here and just go on this tirade about <laughs> them not being there working out, like, these guys are young. When you're young, you truly care more about yourself than a coach can ever care about your performance. Thank you. Period. Thank you, do you really think I'm not going to be here and not work hard? Thank There's you. no that way. That applies to everybody in the locker room. Jalen Ramsey was a pro there. bowler last year. Jalen Ramsey has on pride. Reputation. He has 
there's not one coach that wouldn't have him on his team. Based on talent, absolutely. It, Based on well, what TJ, it goes back to what Jimmy Johnson used to say, right? I'll treat all my players fairly. I'm not going to treat them all the, the same. same. That's exactly okay, what it is. Listen, I mean, you understand Coleman that as a player Jaylen in the locker Ramsey room. There, make sure that I'm there then. Give me a new contract. If you want me there, pay me like you played Big Wardles last year, and I'm there. How about or, you? Or, or, or Telvin Smith. Give, give they me gave, a contract. TJ, TJ. Incentify, and I'm there. You give me some incentive to be there. And I'll be I there. need you to respect that, one, I got up here to this level based on my skill, my will, and respect that. And I respect my training more so than sometimes going to your not strength and conditioning coach. everybody's will is the same. I, I know that. And you know what? And not every team's strength and conditioning coach and program is for every player. So you need to respect that Jerry Rice needs to run his heel. Hey, a lot of times, and, and not be I'll be doing the you. same workout that they're doing. I don't and I'm a receiver. For, for, l l let's be clear here. The, the other part, I'm going to defend Tom Coughlin. Let's hear it. They've changed the rules that relates to practice during the season. And so that, of course, is going to make organizations put an emphasis more on the offseason. Stop. When, no, no. Like, when Jerry Rice and them was practicing, they was having two and three hour practices. Oh, oh, training right. camp was, training yeah. camp was oh, almost oh, too much long. Yeah, it oh, was training cool. camp was completely raise, different. Raise your hand if it you was. played in that NFL. I did. And you know what I we did also too. did? You know, I got we a little bit of also? it. OTAs. Huh. I remember when I got drafted. Oh, you said you didn't have We that? did not. I, right, I know. So on, the rule changes are not just within practice and, and how you're going to practice. It's now we added all these things. To I make up for the fact that we can't really practice during the season. No, no, follow me. The origin of this, in 1997 when I was drafted, I got a call, you're drafted, see you at minicamp. Went to minicamp for three days, they said, see you at training camp. Peace. Now, all of a sudden, you look up a year or two later, you're like, what's this mandatory voluntary? What's this OTA and mandatory voluntary? And now they went back and reduced it. But guess what? Let's go back to where you started it. There were greats who played the game in the legends of yesteryear who didn't need to be babysat like this. It's crazy. Marcellus, the, the other thing, <laughs> when they give you great wealth, the expectations elevate. They did that in the, the, no, no, no. in the 80s. But, but, they didn't give them great wealth in the 80s. In the, not like they're getting no. now. In the 90s. No. It's not even close. No, it's, it's, right. it's, it's not even close. It's all relative. It's all relative. What? 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 It's okay. all relative. Okay. No, 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 okay, no, well, no, no. No, no, it's not, not like that it relative. The, the popularity of the game yeah. has increased exponentially. Yeah, it's exponentially. Oh, oh no I give you that. Give them a Because you acting like they wasn't making money in the 90s. Stop playing. Joining the show now is Yahoo Sports NBA insider Chris Haynes. Mark Medina, who covers the Warriors for the Mercury News in San Jose. All right, let's talk some NBA. Sponsored by Toyota, let's go places. A couple of all-stars returned to form last night. The Nets' Jared Dudley said Ben Simmons was just an average half-court player mm. in, in, in half-court situations. And Simmons responded with 31 points in the absence of Joel Embiid as the Sixers took a 2-1 series lead over Brooklyn out west. Kevin Durant bounced back from two forgettable games in Oakland by scoring a game-high 38 points in Staples Center as the Warriors took a commanding 2-1 series lead and brought Marcellus to tears uh, <laughs> last night. Uh, who made a bigger statement last night? I'm sure we're all in agreement. Ben Simmons, uh, you know, made the bigger statement. Who knew that Ben Simmons could score 31 points, uh, shoot the high percentage he did from the field and the free throw line? Everybody knew Kevin Durant was a superstar player and that, you know, at any time he could drop 38, 40 points, any time he wanted. Obviously, we're all in agreement here. Ben Simmons was the <laughs> – made the biggest Man, statement last night. I know we've only worked together for six months, <laughs> but you really don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> it was Kevin Durant for me uh, to quietly – yell to everyone, I am Kevin Durant. And for everyone to have to take notice, which you should have never, ever lost sight of, that that's Kevin Durant. That's a huge statement. Because he didn't go out there and bark it up. He didn't go out there and get outside his game to do what he did in the 38 points and the efficiency and the defensive presence. You know what he did? What? He went out there and said, <laughs> how in the hell have I played 979 games I'd see on here? And y'all throw those out the window in my body of work to yell at me about two games Myself. against the undersized <laughs> gnat of Myself. a defender in Pat Beverly? Y'all crazy. So. Myself, do, you, do you know the name Metal Lark Lemon? No, I just Metal heard Lark it. Lemon. Globe Globe was that a cartoon? Globe Trotters. Globe Globe Trotters. Metal Lark Lemon. Oh, yeah. If he had a bad game against the Washington Generals and said, my name is Metal Lark Lemon, would you be shocked if he came out the next day against the Washington Generals and clown suited them? The Clippers, the Washington Generals. 
the second worst team in the playoffs. The hmm. Clippers. That's who Kevin Durant beat up. A baby seal. Go ahead, Chris. A baby I'm sure seal. You, I'm sure you <laughs> Wait a agree. Minute. With you. you took that whole thing in different places. <laughs> but like I know we've only been working together for two months, but yeah. you clearly don't know me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this. Look, come on now. This is Kevin Durant we're talking about, and there are factors in play here. Mm. Not, not, not only is this the probably one of the most high-profile series in the playoffs right now. It's Kevin Durant. <laughs> it's the, oh, oh, <laughs> the Clippers are involved. Oh, 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 listen, yes, I understand. But there, there's a yeah, drama. Sure. There's a drama involved. There's Dang. the Patrick the, the Beverly element. Yeah. There's Kevin Durant's pending free agency. Right. There is this, there's this element of, if, is this team going to be intact? Is this the last hurrah? Mm. Now, look, I love what Ben Simmons did. That was big. But was he big. was caught. Look, I love Jared Dudley. But I'm sorry, that's not exactly the ratings ain't boosting over that drama over there. I'm sorry, it's just a little bit different. It's mm -hmm. a different beast over here. And what he did and the way Kevin Durant has been active all this whole season, that's why all the attention and the lights are focused on what um, – Mark, I'm right sure now. you agree with me. And, and Jace, I do not want to gang up on you here, but I'm going to gang up on you here. Because <laughs> here, here's, I will give you this. Ben Simmons, it was the least surprising that Kevin Durant had the game that he had because he's Kevin Durant. Ben Simmons is a young player that's just getting started. He had all those comparisons entering the NBA about, hey, he could be the next Magic Johnson, but a lot of question marks of how much of a shooter he is. But Kevin Durant's performance was the most entertaining. Chris Haynes hit on most of the points, but another subplot that was very interesting is kind of the back and forth that Steve Kerr and he are having, where Steve Kerr says before game three, he wants Kevin to be more aggressive. He wants him to get 20, 30 shots, and KD's kind of sneering and saying, I'm not going to try to just get 20 or 30 shots and mess up the offense and telling me, hey, how do you want me to play when I'm asking how should – how aggressive should you be? And then he answers like that, has a fun back and forth with Chris about how much he's a playmaker, a scorer, and when he decides to do both. So he is the most entertaining performance of the night. Oh, oh, oh. Mark, I know this is your first time on the show, <laughs> but you are a journalist. There so you I, go. Just want, I want to point to this. Who made a bigger statement? It, not who was more entertaining. Who made a bigger statement? And that's why, again, I'm going to go back to I can't believe y'all sitting here when I watched Kevin Durant in the first quarter last night, I was like, oh, that's, that's Texas. That's the University of Texas, that long Kevin one. Durant. <laughs> that's what, I saw that. I saw him come to yeah. Fall Gallon, Kansas Arena, and do exactly what he mm -hmm. did last night. Like, damn, seven foot, can shoot like that, can take it off the bounce on people like that. There was nothing new here. That was vintage Kevin Durant. But we didn't learn anything new. Ben Simmons... It's like, oh, there is a way for him to be an effective scorer and carry a team in a playoff game. There is something here that, you know. We, you ben learned Simmons, that? Even though <laughs> you, didn't know, you didn't watch game two? 31. But you didn't see game two when he was balling as well. Game one, he was absent hey, but, compared to his but, standards. But he is an all-star, too. And he's an all-star. Here's the thing. This is LeBron 2.0 if he gets his jump shot. We all know Ben Simmons is walking triple-double. But you know why it took something off for me other than the fact that that series is not as interesting as the Clippers and Golden State? Because <laughs> you was in the Staples Center. That's why I wasn't at dinner. Damn go ahead. right. And I'll be there Sunday, too. I need a win. You shouldn't go. But go ahead. <laughs> it's going to be ugly. Enjoy your Easter. Enjoy Oh, yo, he's <laughs> Let me say this. Y'all think that Ben Simmons went out there motivated because, you know what, people were clowning me and Jared Dudley. It was the quote-unquote leaked bogus story, Philadelphia Sixers are saying, about Joel Embiid is our no, no trade player and Ben Simmons was on the block. Remember that happened? Mm -hmm. And so Ben Simmons is like, and Embiid's not playing? So he went for broke. He went out of character. And you can say that that's a greater statement. I think you're proving his point. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not. That <laughs> statement that he's trying to make is, is not going to be something that's sustainable and it's not something that you were going to look at and see again. Game two, he balled out. Game three, he balled out. And you trying to say that's a big statement? I just think that the guy went out there with a little extra sauce and went out of character. Kevin Durant went out there and said, I'm just going to play my game. And that speaks the loudest. Like, the one who barks to me ain't the one with the bite. Kevin Durant went out there from first quarter on, silent assassin. You want to say it's the guy who went out there fully motivated? I don't see it. Yeah. Welcome back. Mike. All right, Marcellus, TJ. What it do? Time to get anti-social. Mm, My favorite good. segment, Darnell Smith. What up? 
walk us through these Twitter streets, bro. Man, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling good. I'm ready. You all right? That right. hike took it all out of yeah. you a couple days ago. You Still on the high from Little Wayne. Uh, He's blowing <laughs> up. <laughs> anyway, yeah. let's start with Tiger Woods. Yeah. His golfing buddy and fellow GOAT, Michael Jordan, called Tiger's Masters win the greatest comeback he's ever seen. But golf fans and writers are jumping on Twitter to pump the brakes, mm. reminding people that Ben Hogan survived a head-on car crash with the Greyhound bus in 1949. Hogan spent 59 days in the hospital recovering from a broken pelvis and blood clots and had doubts he could ever walk again. But a year later, he went on, went on to win the U.S. Open and another five majors after that. We're like, you're our resident Tiger fan, so I want to start with you. Whose comeback story was better, Woods or Ben Hogan? Uh, Sunday during the Masters, I was assured that it was Tiger Woods. I felt confident. Then uh, Jimmy Roberts of NBC tweeted at me and told me about Ben Hogan. I was like, ooh, I got to go. Let me go to the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Research. Google. Go ahead and uh, Ben Hogan to the bigger comeback. Oh, uh, well, you know what? Um, one, uh, MJ, Barkley. Y'all can stop begging. Tiger ain't gonna be your homie no more. <laughs> <laughs> they keep coming. I've been watching Barkley. He's talking good about it. Like, y'all done, man. It's in the past. But respect to y'all. I, I don't like to choose in this one. I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, especially right now with all the conversation about mental health and dependency issues, which Tiger went through, sometimes it gets minimized compared to a physical issue. So we see Ben Hogan in the hospital, obviously traumatic. And respect, that's a tremendous comment. I'd rather have a sex addiction then break every bone in my body in a car crash. Oh, look, look, I'm not choosing <laughs> any one of those things. I'm not saying, but Tiger had went to his own between thing. The two. But if I had to choose between <laughs> the two, like, it's tough. It's tough, because that feels like I'm minimizing one, but still for me, it's Tiger. Still for me, Tiger. Yeah, I'm, it has to be Tiger, and it's just one reason. It was 1949. I mean, I wasn't born. Mm. I'm, I was around when Tiger went through what he went through. And so to see the comeback after hearing so many people say, True. ah, you're not coming. It was 1949. It was so long ago. That's why it's been minimized. It was a long well, how about this? time ago. And it was an 11-month recovery. Respect. 11 months. Tigers this is was years. What, 10 years? 11 years? And so that like, is just because it was ni just because it was 1940. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on, y'all. Prisoners right, of the moment. Well, go ahead. I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you too? Oh, go ahead. All right, you guys talked about Ben Simmons' big game, but before the game, yesterday Jeez. on the herd, Colin talked about a report saying the Sixers should consider trading Simmons. But he actually had a theory that said they should really trade Joel Embiid instead. Take a listen. He and Embiid don't play well together. I don't think they love each other, and their games don't work. Because Embiid needs to be low, that clogs up the middle, and that's where Ben Simmons scores. Embiid's been hurt. Embiid's a center. Look at Carl Anthony Towns. Look at Anthony Davis. Look at, where are these guys all winning series? Where are all these big guys? Where's the league going? Do y'all agree with Kyle in the decision to trade Embiid? I found it fascinating. Yesterday when he said it, I was like, man, that's crazy. It sounds interesting. Then I watched last night's game, and I was like, damn, makes sense. Got you. Um, look, this was a forced conversation to have because of the alleged reports that they were thinking about trading Ben Simmons. If you force me to say one stays, one goes, oh, it's not even, a, it's a no-brainer. Joe M.B. has to go because of the injury concern, because of his style of play. Uh, those type of guys, the centers, the, se the seven-footers that don't move as Stays well. Fast. Yeah, man. I got to yeah, go with I, I would, I would trade uh, M.B. and it's, just because of the injury history. You, you miss your whole rookie year, you're hurt. Your knees, you're missing playoff games. So if you're missing playoff games, it's bad. Yeah, and so yeah, just probably. from that perspective alone, Embiid's a baller. But he, he, the injury, I, I got to keep Ben Simmons. Availability. But it's crazy that Colin says that, and then he just balls out last night. Mm -hmm. uh, mm? Crazy. But then Trying the next game, Ben Simmons might go two for ten. And, we'll and find out we tomorrow. We'll find out. Right. Okay, right. Donna. All right, All right. Well, anyway, we're going to move on to the NFL. <laughs> A lot of noise has been coming from the Raiders organization, from Twitter happy Antonio Brown to their difficult schedule. And now this morning, a report came out that John Gruden and GM Mike Mayock sent their scouts home for the weekend, and they are not expected to return by draft time. Supposedly, the reason is information's been getting leaked out, and they no longer know who they can trust. Guys, what's going on with the Raiders here? Uh, they're going to fire their scouting department. They've gotten all their information they can get from them. And so now they're going to let, let him go and replace him with Gruden people. Uh, I, I don't like this, though. I, 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 this mm. is a red flag for me. I right? disagree with you. Um, one, there's no noise coming out of there because ain't no scouts in the building. It's just two people <laughs> in that room with three first-round draft picks, right? If you own three first-round draft picks, a lot of flexibility, a lot of maneuverability, a lot of moves could be made. And I think this is a smart play. It's like, 
because we're going to play a lot of poker in here. And we can't trust all the players. And this is not even a negative towards you. It's just because what we're going to do may involve a lot of scenarios. We don't want any of this to leak because we playing poker out there. Man, I don't know what the Raiders doing. It's <laughs> so soon. So the draft is next week. Right. Like, come on, man. I, I don't know what they're doing. I have no idea. Hopefully next week they'll make me a believer. I, I like Marcellus's theory, though, because, again, the information's all in. Now it's like, let me get you out of harm's way. Mm -hmm. So if something does leak, I can't blame you. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're protecting him. All right, time for Darnell's question of the day. Take it away. All right, guys. So as you know, the last two days, my favorite rapper, Lil Wayne. Yeah, yeah. Not only gave me a shout out, but, mm. but last night gave Uncle Jimmy one too. Mm. You know, and seeing Wayne give our show so much love has just made me speechless. So it made me want to ask you guys, have you guys ever been starstruck? Man, can you read? He said our names too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we like you. We like you. But, 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 but the just oh, right, right. right. you already know you. You, you know Wayne. Come on, slime. That shit hell your friend, right? I'm just saying. Can we get some of that? Oh, oh, no. You ever been starstruck, bro? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge. I, I, Dr. Dre's talent as a musician baffles me and blows me away. Years ago, at a Mike Tyson fight in the '90s, we were at the same pre-fight party. Mm. And he, he walked in, and my eyes got big, and he walked straight towards me and shook my hand. And I don't even remember what I said, but it, 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 I was starstruck. Is it Dre? Is it Dre? <laughs> Did you say that? <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> That's what they say. Um, I've been starstruck so many times, I'm going to go to the first one. Because I've had a 1,000 moments like that. Magic Johnson, him, you know, you talk about even Lil Wayne. We host I DJ for Lil Wayne. I DJ for the Outkast. I'm talking to Dre. Big boy. Come on, man. Too many of those. But the first one? Carl Lewis. I was like, I was really good in track, winning the Nationals, mm. and I was on a field in the infield while the professionals were running because I was part of the National group. This is at Mount Sac, and all of a sudden I see Carl Lewis. This is Carl Lewis, Mr. Gold Medal. This is pre-Usain Bolt big time, and he ran by me, and I was like, that's Carl Lewis, and I took off to try and get an autograph, and he saw me, and he went, move, little kid, and you know what? That, I ain't gonna lie. It hurt. It hurt. But I realized, mm. one, he preparing for his work. He got to go do his thing. Nah. That's bad on me. I saw him 20 years later at a party. He my best friend, dog. I told him the story. He like, oh, man, I ain't mean nothing. I was just out there trying to get right. But that was the first moment I was like, big eye. I've never been starstruck, and I'm going to tell you why. I, one time I was at the airport, and I, I do regret this, and I was just sitting there waiting on my wife. She was picking me up late, so I was already mad. Mm. And Muhammad Ali just walks up to me mm. and just starts throwing punches at me, messing around. And a lot of people recognized him and started coming over wanting a picture. My wife pulls up, I hop in the car, and she was like, was that Muhammad Ali? Did you get a picture? And I was like, nah. Mm. And the reason I've never been starstruck is because we play sports for a living. There's athletes, entertainers. And you notice, a lot of guys act like they're more than what they are. Mm. And so the reason I don't approach anybody is because you're not going to big time me. Mm. If you big time me, then it might be a problem. Mm. How Carl Lewis did you, mm. I'd have been like, Really, bro? <laughs> At like, nine? And y'all know me. Nine. There's a lot of people that do that. Whitlock and Wiley joined once again by Chris Haynes and Mark Medina. Let's return to the NBA, where Adrian Wojnarowski is reporting that the Lakers GM, Rob Palenka, is meeting with Ty Lue today to discuss their head coaching vacancy. Palenka met earlier this week with the other leading candidate, Sixers assistant, Monty Williams. Adding to the intrigue, there are other reports from ESPN that both Lou and Williams are being told by everyone in the league not to take the job because the Lakers are such a mess right now. All right, Ramona Shelbourne, I think, had this report. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just points to what I believe is uh, widespread may not be the right word, but there is a anti-LeBron movement within the league, anti-Rich Paul and LeBron, and people trying to undermine their ability to have success to the point advising people not to take the Lakers job. I, 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 I don't know how I feel about it. It's inevitable. Again, we've talked about this for the past month or so. When you seize as much power as Rich Paul and LeBron have, there are going to be people that try to counteract that. Yeah, uh, the anti-LeBron movement is real, but it's being trumped and... It's actually predated by the anti-Laker movement, if you really want to be real about it. Luke Walton was told by his dad, Bill Walton, don't you go down there and take that job. And Luke, the son, did what he had to do. Now he's up in 
Sacramento. But I remember those moments when they were trying to get Luke Walton and poach him from the Golden State Warriors as a young talent. Uh, you talk about LeBron, the anti-LeBron movement. It's, it's twofold. One, you're on the Lakers in that coaching carousel in the last eight years, six coaches. Damn it. Averaging 33 wins and no playoff appearances. So it's an anti-LeBron movement that just got morphed into an anti-Laker movement and all of their issues since the change in ownership. They have not figured themselves out and which way is up with this franchise. Now, are there people out there, individuals out there, who are advising these guys not to take the take this job because Pop, of that. Popovich? <laughs> <laughs> Pop, I say that a little bit louder. Right. Right. Phil Jackson. May, may, maybe so, but 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 let's let's keep it real. One of the main reasons why this job is such attractive because of that guy right there, mm -hmm. LeBron James in the helm. Yeah, I know it's an open position, and I know it's the Los Angeles Lakers, but you're not. Look, LeBron, you. It takes a special coach to be able to reach out to him, to be able to get the best out of him. It's only a few have been able to do it. Spolstra, Tyron Lue. So if you're a coach and you get the chance to coach LeBron James and you take that team to great heights, you'll be revered and cherished throughout your whole entire career. So this is a great opportunity for Tyron Lue again and Monty Williams. Yes, there are people saying don't take the job. Uh, he's running the show, him and Rich Paul. But look, man, what makes that team attractive is you got LeBron. If you got LeBron, that's the opportunity for other guys to come on and build this championship team. Yeah, and look, there might be some fair questions down the line of, hey, LeBron was having that groin injury. Is this a sneak preview of what's to come with father time? But the larger issue is the front office. They haven't replaced Magic Johnson's position yet. All signs indicate that Rob Palenka's having that position. He's not well-liked around the NBA. And when you look at the previous front office with Mitch Kupchak and Jim Buss, they had all those free agency strikeouts, and the reason why there were those free agency strikeouts, it went beyond the fact that Kobe had that extension, he was injured. It was because they didn't have that clarity of what the roster direction was. You had a mix of young guys that were unproven. You had a mix of guys on one-year deals that had varying success. And when you fast forward now, it's almost to a similar degree what the Lakers' story is as well. Marcellus, I liked your point because I hadn't even thought about the Lakers are the most favored team in NBA history in terms of Will Chamberlain magically wound up here. <laughs> Kareem Abdul-Jabbar magically. Shaquille O'Neal. Whatever the biggest thing going is just happens to end up with the Los Angeles Lakers. Oh, yeah. That creates jealousy. That creates like, come on, the NBA is favoring these guys. They want that franchise propped up. And so there will be people on the other side of that seesaw trying to send it the other way, and perhaps LeBron and Rich Parr getting swept up in that as well. All right, while Palenka is looking for a new head coach, the search for Magic Johnson replacement in the front office <clears throat> is still underway as well. Stephen A. Smith suggested today that former Laker head coach and current Heat president Pat Riley is in the mix for that job. I find that fascinating. I, I saw this uh, conversation with Stephen A. Smith mm. earlier today, and I think it's it would be a great play by Jeannie Buss if some they could offer Pat Riley part of the franchise, the presidency. That to me is a real solution to the Lakers' problem. Look, it is a solution because we all know the greatness of Pat Riley in terms of his role in running the organization. It's a smart move but it's the same old Lakers move. And it's interesting. Mm. I heard someone term it this way. My man Ben Lyons said the Lakers make musty moves. And when he means musty moves, like the same old tires. stinky. Pat Riley? Pat, no, I'm just going to get through this. You call him Pat Riley musty. I'm not saying no. I said Pat Riley's Explain a smart yourself. one, but it's the same <laughs> Lakers move. The Lakers eat their own. Jeannie Buss and Jim Buss. Y'all know how that went down? Do you know what she said about her, her own brother? Yeah. You see how I treat him? Think how I'll get after anybody else. Yeah. Steve Ballmer, Ballmer. kind of took notice of, notice of that as well. Okay, that's fine. Balls. That's, that's <laughs> sibling relationship. Uh, let's talk about who they bring in as coaches. Oh, let's bring in our guys. Who has Lakers ties? Byron Scott. Byron Scott. Yeah. How'd that go down? Boy, they, prop, they made Byron have four interviews knowing that all they was doing was just trying to prop him up to tear him down. Luke Walton, one of your own. Uh, G, G, where is Jerry West? 
in the same building. <laughs> With the Clippers. <laughs> With the Clippers. <laughs> they eat their own. So Pat Riley is a smart play because he's Pat Riley. But if I'm Pat Riley, one, I'm not coming to California for that millionaire 13% tax. I got a boat in the back of my, my, my house in Florida. I'm not going there when you eat your own as a Lakers franchise. So smart to get him, but not smart for him to come. No, that's a different story. That's a different, oh, that's a different topic. It. But, but you said it sounded like the way you were saying it, it's like they have no business going after Pat Riley. I, I think that Pat Riley should take the call out of respect uh -huh. because that's where it started, but then hang up that phone because it's better where you are. Okay, no, I, I, that, I, I agree with you there. Disagree. I, I, you disagree? You disagree? It's a better job. The Lakers, again, Wilt, Kareem, Shaq, LeBron. Peace, stability, success. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> Happiness. Structure. <laughs> structure. Yeah. He's My going to install cool. the structure. They're going to give him total control. Oh, like you they did with Jenny, Magic, You huh? think Jenny will? Like they yes. did with Magic, right? They have no choice. Like they did with Magic, right? Yeah, right. Don't Magic oh. and Pat Riley ain't the same when it comes to that executive. I agree, but the power is not the same either. I, I agree, and, but I, I do think, look, if that's true, they're headed in the right direction because we've all talked about they need somebody experienced and competent in that front office. Rob Palenka doesn't have the experience. And for you talk to a lot of agents, a lot of executives out there, he doesn't have the people skills to connect. Pat Riley has all that, and he has a resume. So if you can pull that off, that would be a bit cool. And I know yep. they, like, they like to keep it in the Laker family. Look, if you want to keep it in the Laker family, there's only two options out there. Jerry. Jerry and Pat. And to your larger point, Pat's a good move because he has the experience. He's putting in the work. But the larger direction that the, the Lakers should be going to is they should be reaching out and getting permission to talk to the Bob Myers of the worlds and the Sam Prestes and the R.C. Bufords. Maybe some of them say no, but if they come to them and say, what's it going to take? Here is a blank check. You are going to have that elevated position where you are in the position of power. That will get them back to where they are. It seems like right now they're really stuck in sticking within the Laker family, but then not allowing them to do their job. Well, there, if... Pat Riley's the only play to me that makes sense because he has had success with LeBron James. He understands yeah. exactly what he would be getting into. And look, it gives them the option, in my opinion, let's say LeBron won't get on board with Pat Riley. That gives them the out mm. to move on from LeBron mm. if that's yeah. what they want to do. Mm. LeBron did move on from Pat Riley before. Yeah. And, I mean, had Dwayne <laughs> Wade and Pat Riley chasing him around in some Olympic year, like, yeah. on, on, on G5s. It's crazy. I say musty moves. They need to cleanse their thinking. Do something out the box. To, if, if Pat Riley takes the call, like, oh, you're calling me because of our Laker ties and our history. And then you call Magic with the same conversation. Then you call Byron. Then you call like even if they're different levels, it's still how the principle of how you treat someone. Mm -hmm. I'm just not liking the treatment. It's a proven track record. Yeah. It would be, oh, this, respect. This to me would be like saying the Buffalo Bills shouldn't call Bill Belichick. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I, I don't see that because that, that ain't musty. I, 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 you know, <laughs> yeah, that's why. Well, one he ain't got no Buffalo Bills connection, so <laughs> right. they ain't even gonna call. Well, well, Cleveland okay. Browns. Yeah, Cleveland yeah, Browns. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I respect what you're saying. It's just the Lakers. There's two plays here. <laughs> Do the same thing, which is within our rolodex of past players, who can or past executives, who can we call? Or go, like you said, RCB, for anybody out there who's really doing this, who's not going to sit there and say, oh, you just calling me because of the... I'm on speed dial because I'm a late. i tell you what, I, next time I see Pat Riley, I'm going to give him a good smell. <laughs> I want to see, see if this is it. The late Pat Riley. My son is, you, you married now. You don't remember your single days when you got you left one girlfriend and you would call an old girlfriend uh -huh. just to get you through? Let's go back to the Staples Center where Kevin Durant silenced his critics with a game-high 38 points against the Clippers last night. KD had been frustrated by Patrick Beverly defending him the first two games, resulting in an ejection in game one and fouling out with nine turnovers in game two. After the game, Durant had an interesting back and forth with our own Chris Haynes. Over the last month or so, you've been, you know, pass first, been distributor for the team. That's not true. That's not? No, I don't pass up shots. I just play within the offense. Oh, I, I say, okay. Well, you've been more of a distributor. Is that safe to say? Yeah, just because I would play. Okay, that's why. Tonight, you wasn't, right? Yeah, because Coach called more plays for All me right. to start. Okay, so moving forward, do you think that it will be a game-by-game -game basis as far as 
how you approach the game? Look, this is I don't run the show. Any team I've ever been a part of, I'm just a player. I'm one of the guys, you know what I'm saying? So whatever my coach needs me to do, whether uh, no matter what it is, I just got to go out there and be prepared for it mentally and physically. So tonight, no different. I love this KD. Man. I, 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 I love it. Man. The, I love the way KD's handling the playoffs, this particular situation. I liked his explanation after game two, <laughs> and I love this explanation here. I mean, I'm not going next. Uh, Chris, <laughs> allow me to <laughs> give you the floor, brother. Uh, what, 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 what we say That myself? energy was different, even though y'all got to a re uh, respectful place. It uh -huh. just seemed like the energy was different, because you explain it, but what did you feel in that moment? How do you like it? Well, look, I, I think I think it all boils down to that, that 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 graphic back there. I think that's that's what's been the issue. Uh, people criticizing him and saying that Patrick Beverly is getting in his skin. Uh, KD is not able to go off like he like he usually does. And I think in my question, he kind of felt I was going in a negative direction mm -hmm. when I was starting it off saying, well, you've been passed first. Like, no, I ain't passing stuff up. I, I'm just taking what the defense gives me. Chris, I, I hear it completely different. I, I don't think he's defensive at all. I think he has been explaining over the past few days what's been going on. Well, it's Steve what? Kerr. Oh, here go another one. Y'all go. It's Steve Kerr. <laughs> uh -huh. it, Steve Kerr, he's doing what Steve Kerr is asking to do. Well, all I was asking, this is this yep. my whole point of the question was to see what is his approach moving forward. Because the first two games, he averaged 12 shots. Then the last game, 23. Mm. So the question was, what KD are we going to see moving forward? Now, and that his, was it. And his respect for you, because that's what I think everybody no, 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 on the no Warriors doubt. has a great deal of respect for you. And I think he's like, like quietly going, Chris, man, I've been trying to tell you. Is this dude, Steve <laughs> Kerr. Mm. Mm. Go ask him mm. why I took hey. 10 or 12 shots in hey. the game. Don't ask me. That's, I think he has that much respect. Like, Chris, you're not picking up on these things? You might have a point there, Whit. Mm. And, I, and I respect the, the back and forth that Kevin had. Earlier in the week, he had somewhat of a similar exchange with me where Steve Kerr was saying, I want KD to be aggressive. I want him to get 20, 30 shots. Someone presents that to him. He says, hey, I'm not going to just get 20 or 30 just for the sake of it. But Steve's larger point was he wants to be aggressive. So I followed up, well, what about the aggressiveness part? And he's like, hey, let's have a conversation. How do you want me to play? But then once it was explained to him, hey, this is to get your input because Steve is saying this, that opened up the floor where he was dissecting how the Clippers are defending him and his thought process. It was a fascinating interview they to hear what makes often. him tick. Yeah, yeah. all well, the time. That's so what's going on. KD is on his way out, perhaps, and he's not going to he's not going to let Draymond or anybody say, man, you did some different things you and you got out. outside of mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. It was all about you. He's like, no, nah, man, I'm a good soldier. Steve Kerr is our coach. If you if there's a problem, take it up with the coach. And that's why earlier in the segments we were talking about what better statement, big statement. I thought it was KD because he stayed within his skin and stayed within his scheme, but he went out there and balled out. And then he could just sit there and in a relaxed state. We all know that he's a different breed, right? And in the studying of breeds of dogs, mm -hmm. we all know there's different types of behavior. There are the ones that as soon as you walk by the porch, rawr, 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 and nothing's <laughs> going to happen but a lot of noise, right? And then I remember studying Rottweilers, how they have a wait-and-see approach. Like, they will let you get right here, and they're just reading you. And it's funny, KD is now, like, you can see him showing you that I'm just reading this. And... Fine, you could be mad at me. Why am I not barking? Why am I not over there trying to attack? But guess what? I, like I dare you take one more step. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you. I'm Kevin Durant. I'm this rock. I'm about to attack. And that's what he did last night. That was huge. All right, mm. before we go, I'd like to say a word or two about Kate Smith, the New York Yankees, and the Philadelphia Flyers. The New York Daily News reported yesterday that the Yankees quit playing Smith's rendition of God Bless America during their seventh inning stretch after the club was made aware of Smith's potential racism. This morning, newspapers in Philadelphia reported the Flyers are cutting ties with Smith, too, covering a statue honoring her with a blanket. Smith, a popular singer in the 1940s, has been dead since 1986. She rose to fame in 1938 when Jewish compo composer Irving Berlin rewrote God Bless America specifically for Smith and as a peacetime protest 
of Adolf Hitler. Because of Smith's rendition, God Bless America became this country's second national anthem. Smith used the popularity of the song to raise war bonds during World War II. She's credited with generating $600 million in support of the war effort. President Ronald Reagan awarded her the Pre Presidential Medal of Freedom. I have to admit, before yesterday, I had no idea who Kate Smith was. When her name dropped in the news, I thought she was one of the actresses on Charlie's Angels, but that was Kate Jackson. Anyway, Kate Smith recorded a couple of problematic, seemingly bigoted songs. That's why darkies were born and pick a ninny heaven. I use the word seemingly because black civil rights hero Paul Robeson also sang That's Why Darkies Were Born, and the song was considered satire, mocking the concept of racism. Smith sang Piccaninny Heaven in the 1933 big budget movie, Hello Everybody. If you know anything about Hollywood in 2019 or in 1933, you know that Kate Smith did exactly what she was told to do by the liberal elitist executives running the movie and music industries. Women won the right to vote in 1920. Am I supposed to believe that 13 years later, Kate Smith, a 250 pound woman who was routinely publicly fat shamed, was calling shots on what she did and didn't sing in movies? Once again, our emotions and minds are being toyed with. The people who blackmail the Yankees into Dumpy Smith's version of God Bless America are not trying to clean up American racism. They're sowing seeds of division and undermining American pride under the bogus pretense that they're promoting racial harmony. No rational person of any color thinks eliminating a dead woman from Yankee Stadium improves re race relations. In fact, it does the opposite. It creates the impression of a ridiculous racial double standard. A long dead white woman is held to a higher standard than any millionaire or billionaire black rapper. If you want to hear an anti-black song, we don't have to go black to the 1930s. Go listen to my favorite rapper, Dr. Dre's Rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. He brags about never hesitating to put an N-word on his back. Uncle Jimmy's here uh, to help us talk about our approval rating. Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what, man? Big dummy today, what is What is this? First of all, let me tell you, let me let me just get straight to it, brother. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the big dummy of the day is going to go to whoever it was that said that Giselle won a Super Bowl. <laughs> How many passes did she throw, Whitlock? He didn't say that, but he... Big dummy. <laughs> talking about things. she deserved credit. She does yeah, deserve yeah, credit. That part. She might get credit. <laughs> she got credit. All right, here's a and highlight from our discussion <laughs> earlier These about Kevin credit. Durant. The one who barks to me ain't the one with the bite. Kevin Durant went out there from first quarter on, silent assassin. The Clippers, the Washington Generals, the second worst team in the playoffs. Hmm. The Clippers, that's who Kevin Durant beat up, a baby seal. Go ahead, Chris. A baby I'm sure seal? You, I'm sure you <laughs> Wait agree. Wait a minute. <laughs> All right, Uncle man. Jimmy. Sneaky. We uh, had a good discussion about Kevin Durant. What's your take? First of all, man, uh, I must much respect uh, Kevin Durant, but let's go on and get to what we need to talk about, man. Hey, you, you saw who tweeted your boy out last night, right? Uh, you, oh. you, 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 you saw your boy Lil Waldy, uh, a.k.a. Lil Wayne, uh, uh, hollered at your boy last night. Oh, ah, there it is right there. <laughs> you see that right there? Yeah. See, I keep trying to tell you a lot of these little young cats look up to Uncle Jimmy. You understand? Yeah. You know, and I, I help him, I give him advice, you know? Uh. Look, 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 Walter, he gave me some advice. He told me, he said, hey, man, look, I'm going to tell you something. We're like, man, all he knows is chicken wings and chitterlings. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him be playing out there playing with your money, man. <laughs> you know? I'm going to tell you something. If I'm a knock him out, I'm going to be undisputed. I'm going to tell you, man. <laughs> That's my dude, man. Uh, we're talking about Kevin Durant. Yeah. What about him? Did you watch the game last night? We're talking well, about Kevin Durant. Wait, hold on, whoa, 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 hold on, whoa. Who, who, who you telling that, bro? Yeah. Hold on, did, 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 did Lil Wayne tweet you out last night? Yeah. No, 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 he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> he tweeted me out. <laughs> okay, first of all, I'm gonna explain something to you. You talking to me like, hey, what, what, what we gonna do about this contract? What we gonna do about this money? Why don't you hit Wayne up? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, no, Wayne the one that put it in my head. See, because this is what I'm trying to tell you. Y'all acting like y'all think this ain't the Jimmy show. <laughs> that's what y'all acting like. Y'all acting like Jimmy ain't out here pushing these ratings. I don't hear you put it on. <laughs> you put it on. Hell Who no. wear it better? We're talking about Kevin Durant. Well, guess what, bro? 
I was out working for the show last night. Mm. I was out at the premiere of When the Family Fight last night. Okay, WWE, Fox. That was me and Paige. Oh, there we is right there. Mm. That's me and Paige. Okay. And Renee Harris from the WWE. I'm out here networking for your show. You understand? I'm out here grinding like that for you. But you know what? While you're cracking jokes and whatnot, talking about you better talk to Lil Wayne. Okay, you know, I'm talking about Lil Wayne. You know, we done talk about Tony and Mike. Kornheiser. You know, but you know who else got interest in, you know, got interest in Uncle Jimmy? Vince McMahon got some interest in Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> Vince McMahon said, hey, if you're gonna wear all these crazy costumes, I might have something for you. Come holler at your boy. Not built like that. <laughs> hey, bro, let me tell you something. No, you ain't wrestling. Huh? You ain't wrestling nobody. We're talking about <laughs> no. Kevin Durant. What about him? D did you watch the game last night? Yes, I did, and guess what I realized? What? That man working for a new contract, ain't he? <laughs> you see what kind of work you get out of somebody when you put a contract in front of them? <laughs> now, what we gonna do, man? I'm for real. Y'all can play with Darnell. Y'all can crack little t-shirt jokes or whatnot. Y'all gonna have to sit down to the table with me. And when you sit down, make sure you got one of them ink pens in your hand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because y'all laughing about it, man. It's all poots and giggles until somebody giggling poop, all right? <laughs> I'm just letting you know. <laughs> I'm telling you what God likes, brother. And it's nothing but the truth. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Lame, man. Tell him what I said, Sharif Ali. <laughs> <laughs> That is not my pay grade. Oh, go my up. God. <laughs> fifth floor, bro. Go to fifth right, floor. Well, I got <gasps> something to say about Kevin Durant. What you got to say? He's reached GOAT status <sighs> oh, me on my it? approval rating. You think? Yeah, last night he got his job performance <sighs> up. I got him at a 24, 22 all-time greatest, 20 in character, and I bumped him up in authenticity for the way he's handled this week. Kevin Durant now 81, an official <laughs> Go. Yeah, he's a yeah. big fat goat for me. Authenticity pretty low from before me. and. He had a burner now. account, man. He had a oh, burner account. Damn. Uh, that's why I got him at a, a, a authenticity. <laughs> A I got 25. him at a 25. <laughs> I think he he came out and told y'all I got a burner account. That's kind of gangster. Like, I got one, and y'all know I got one. Uh, other than that, he just keeps it thorough. He's not passive aggressive. Yeah, he's a GOAT for me, man. He's in the conversation of being the greatest player right now active. 